Good evening, good afternoon, good morning from wherever it is that you're joining us today and welcome to Physician for Human Rights' live Facebook discussion that we're having today. It's going to be a nice Q&A with two experts who are talking to us about chemical weapons attacks and investigations. Our first expert is Professor Alistair Hay, who is an environmental toxicologist at the University of Leeds, and he is a chemical weapons expert. He's been working on the issue for nearly 40 years now. So he's joining us all the way from Leeds today. And our second expert is Susanna Serkin. She's Physicians for Human Rights' is Director of International Policy and Partnerships. And she's very knowledgeable on everything that's been going on in Syria over the last seven years in the conflict. Now, before I go over to them and begin the Q&A, I just want to put everything into a little bit of context for those of you who perhaps have not been following the news that closely. So on April 7th, earlier this month, in Duma, in eastern Ghouta, in Syria, there was a very apparent chemical weapons attack, which left anything from between 40 and 70 people killed, depending on who you believe, because of course the, the details are quite sketchy, and hundreds of people were injured as a result of this attack. The videos and the images which emerged from that attack shocked the whole world and just sent ripples throughout the international community. But unfortunately, that was not the only chemical weapons attack that we know of in Syria. Literally a year earlier, in Khan Sheikhun, there was another one that also left hundreds of people injured and dozens of people. And now it's also very important to understand that this war is entering its eighth year now. And even though chemical weapons attacks are egregious violations of humanitarian law, there have been other attacks happening throughout this conflict, including repeated, targeted, uh, definite um, attacks happening on healthcare facilities and personnel across, across the country that we know have been intentional. So all of these things uh, contribute to a lot of concern, especially organizations such as Physicians for Human Rights and other humanitarian organizations around the world. So having put that now all into context, I'd love to place our first question uh, to Susanna Serkin. Um, if, Susanna, I'm going to put you up on the screen, and if you can, um, there we go, we have Professor Hay there, and we have Susanna Serkin. Welcome to both of you. Susanna, if you uh, can first start by, by letting us know um, sort of what is the history of chemical weapons use, and why exactly is it such an egregious crime? What sets it apart from your traditional warfare weaponry? Well, unfortunately, um, the use of chemical agents and poisons uh, has a long history in warfare, going back all the way to ancient times. Um, chemical weapons, and chemical warfare is essentially the use of compounds to kill or disable people uh, through toxic or poisonous me mechanisms. And obviously, over the centuries, these have evolved into um, the kinds of agents that um, Professor Hay, Alistair, will be able to tell us about in a few moments. But the, what's specific and specifically awful about chemical weapons and chemical warfare is that these weapons, because of their nature and the ways in which they're delivered, are inherently indiscriminate. And we know that uh, humanitarian law, the laws of war, prohibit indiscriminate attacks. When I say indiscriminate, it means that they are just dispersed into the air or onto the ground, and they can attack or affect both combatants and non-combatants alike. So men, women, children, entire populations, entire villages and communities, and indeed, in, in theory, whole countries could be affected um, by this weaponry. Often, um, chemical agents are not seen, are not, uh, in some cases, smelled, and so people don't know where they are or what they're doing. And harm can come uh, to anyone in the surrounding area um, uh, sometimes death within uh, seconds, uh, but also possible um, harms to human life and human health for decades to come. And of course, they not only affect human beings, they affect the entire environment, potentially food, water supply, animals and plants, um, and they can be released in many ways. It's often difficult to detect uh, chemical weapons although uh, Alistair will be able to tell us that there are lots of ways to do that. Um, and, uh, and so they're uniquely terrifying. Uh, physicians for human, well, we know, for example, that um, chemical weapons 
were widely used during World War I, and it's believed that as many as a million people lost their lives as a result of chemical agents deployed during World War I. I'm not going to go into all the other incidents where chemical weapons have been used, but after World War I, there was the, um, <coughs> the, the um, Geneva Protocol of 1925, which prohibited the use of chemical weapons, but because it didn't also prevent the um, uh, production uh, and stockpiling and transfer of these weapons, uh, we then, uh, the world, developed the Chemical Weapons Convention, known as the CWC, in 1993. It entered into force in 97. But uh, unfortunately, before that time, in 1988 and in the mid to late 1980s, um, Saddam Hussein in Iraq deployed chemical weapons on numerous occasions against his own Kurdish population. And many people have heard of the notorious incidents around Halabja. Uh, Physicians for Human Rights actually documented these attacks uh, in the late 1980s, and that's where we first met um, Alistair Hay, uh, because in the early 1990s, we actually were able, with scientists, to collect some soil samples uh, from um, northern Iraq, and uh, with uh, incredible effort, and maybe Professor Hay will describe it briefly, uh, we were able to determine that uh, sarin, uh, a lethal nerve agent, had been deployed against the Kurds. And, and sadly, this is the agent um, that has been uh, now shown to be used as well in, in Syria. It's a it's a, a breaking of a taboo uh, and, and a largely held um, uh, prohibition, at least in the last several decades. And so um, the use now in Syria is, is very specifically uh, concerning. And um, Alistair, if you can maybe pick up um, on the second question of describing for us what are some of the chemical weapons agents that have been used mostly in recent history? For those people who maybe have heard names such as sarin or chlorine gas, explain to us which ones are really the ones that are used most frequently and why you believe they are being used. Uh, Well, Jen. The three uh, chemical agents that we know have been used uh, in Syria are chlorine, which is a gas, mustard gas, which, as Susanna referred to earlier, is an old chemical weapon. It was used in the First World War in 1917. And mustard gas was used because it affects through inhalation, ingestion, or skin contact, like most other chemical weapons now. And the third type of agent that was used in Syria was the nerve agent called sarin. Now, these agents, these chemical weapons, all work in very different ways. Chlorine, as I said earlier, is a gas. It's it's usually delivered as a liquid under pressure, if you like, but then when it's released, it forms a gas. Um, And the effects are very dependent on how much someone is exposed to in the air. And at low concentrations, you tend to get irritated eyes uh, and the upper respiratory tract uh, is affected. And so people will cough uh, and they will have an respiratory tract. But at higher concentrations, the effect is much more serious. The solute, the fluid that lines the lung. Uh, but it is very rapidly dissolved into acid and in the lower parts of the lung, and two acids in particular, hypochlorous and hypochloric acid. And what these acids do is they use up defensive mechanisms in the fluid that lines the lungs, antioxidants as they're called, and then after these are rapidly utilized, uh, the acids affect the lining of the lung, They combine with proteins uh, in the lining of the lung to form other compounds uh, called chloramines, and these cause further damage. So it's damage to the lining of the lung, and that affects movement of fluid uh, and other materials through the lung. And you end up with fluid infusing into the lung, so the lung becomes uh, filled with fluid, and this is what causes the major respiratory problems Uh, and then people will die um, from that if the concentration is high enough. And longer term, that damage can result in, well, it's a little unclear, if you like, because not all people affected at high concentrations have the same problems, but you can have the likes of emphysema, 
a chronic um, obstructive condition, uh, and there may actually be a, a condition where you get severe damage to the lining of the lungs. It's uh, called obliterans. With mustard gas, and we know that mustard gas was used by ISIS or Daesh, as some people refer to it. Uh, and again, it's the dose that causes or determines the outcome. Uh, initially, there isn't a problem, but within about 30 minutes, it's the eyes that are affected and they start to become a bit gritty uh, and sore. Uh, and within a few hours, you start to have problems with people having um, a sore throat, uh, the eyes becoming very watery uh, and increasing problems uh, with people trying to, to breathe, that the voice becomes hoarse. Uh, and you, you may start to get a slight itchiness uh, on the skin. After about oh, 10 or 12 hours or so, people are starting to feel nauseous, they may vomit, uh, um, there may be significant retching, breathing uh, is affected much more, and the symptoms gradually worsen over a 24 hour period. The skin is also affected with mustard gas, uh, and the reason it was introduced as a chemical weapon in the first place in 1917 was simply to get round the protection that troops used before that, which was a gas mask. With mustard gas, you need to have complete protection. Your whole body needs to be protected, and you need to have a gas mask as well. So contact on the skin causes an initial reddening of the skin but then this starts to sort of darken a bit. You then also get blistering, uh, and mustard gas is called a vesicant, and, and vesic vesicles are just big blisters. And these are prominent under the armpits, in the groin, in areas where you start to sweat. Uh, and those blisters, after a time, can burst. If the, the damage is not too severe, uh, the healing may be within a couple of weeks. But if the blisters are severe enough, they may cause ulceration of the skin, and that healing process can take 6 to 12 weeks. And you may, ne may even need to have some skin grafts for that. The damage to the lungs uh, can be very severe, uh, and you can get sloughing of material from uh, the uh, trachea uh, and from the lungs itself. Uh, and long term, that can cause a whole variety of problems. Um, chronic bronchitis, asthma, damage to the lungs, emphysema. Uh, and it's almost like, uh, you know, somebody with those injuries has a decided shortening of their lifespan. You get delayed effects on the eyes with the cornea of the eye becoming, after about six to ten years, uh, becoming opaque and leading to late onset blindness. And the skin, too, can become hyperpigmented, can become scarred, and that scarring causes real awful itchiness. Uh, and I met one man in 2006 who had been suicidal as a result of the itchiness, uh, the scarring it caused in his skin. Nerve agents move you into a different category. These were first developed in 1936 in Germany by a brilliant German chemist who was looking at different insecticides and looking at the family of organophosphate chemicals and nerve agents are at the very toxic end of organophosphate chemicals. The less toxic end are used as insecticides, but they all operate in a similar way. Uh, and what they do in the nervous system is they inhibit an enzyme, it's called acetylcholinesterase, and this enzyme is important in regulating messages down the nervous system but particularly between nerves and muscle. And when that enzyme is blocked by the nerve agents, what it does is essentially send muscles into spasm. So they're no longer able to function in the way they do normally. That is where you get contraction of muscle and relaxation. So the most important and crucial effect uh, is obviously on the muscles that control your breathing. They just don't work. And even people exposed to low concentrations of nerve agents in some volunteer tests in the 1950s and 60s. Describe it as like a band around the chest. So breathing is markedly inhibited. Uh, you have 
uh, e effects on a variety of other organ systems as well, that when people are feel weak, they will collapse, uh, they may vomit, which is a serious problem, uh, clearly, because that can interrupt breathing. Uh, and you get pinpoint pupils, which are very characteristic. You get nausea, vomiting, uncontrolled diarrhea, uh, and urination. So a whole variety of effects simply because the muscles are inhibited. There is very specific treatment um, for the nerve agents. The most crucial thing is to ensure that somebody maintains their breathing, that their airways are open, that the circulation is uh, functioning normally, and that they don't convulse. And those things will all ensure that you don't get damage to the brain, which is the complication with the nerve agents. And then once you can get somebody to hospital, there are some specific antidotes that you can use for the nerve agents. And these are well-known atropine, which will reverse the effects of nerve agents at certain muscle sites, a compound called oxime. And oxime, there are various ones for different nerve agents, and they will pull the nerve agent off the enzyme that's blocked, and you use an anticonvulsant like diazepam. I should say, um, for some of the other compounds like chlorine and mustard gas injuries, treatment generally is just supportive. You're giving things to reduce inflammation on, in the lungs uh, and to assist with breathing largely. Well, it's obviously very important for investigators to get to the site as quickly as possible and to collect that crucial forensic evidence to be able to determine exactly which chemical agent, if any, has been used, not only to properly treat those victims and those survivors, but also to be able to eventually point the finger of blame to somebody to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Now, I understand that there are different teams that take take care of different things, like the OPCW goes there to sort of ascertain which agent was used, and then there are different teams that actually assign blame. Can you, Alistair, just sort of talk us through a little bit the different teams, how they collect the evidence, and how crucial it is that they get there soon after the attack takes place? Well, the standard mechanism now, which should apply to our, the 192 countries that have signed the Chemical Weapons Convention, is for the organization that oversees the chemical weapons, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, if you like, uh, to put together what's called a fact-finding mission. Uh, and that team, and there is one in Syria at present investigating the recent incident, will seek to have access to where it thinks is necessary. And the government, in this case, is the Syrians, is to give unfettered access to the site. You don't want any interference with any of the treating doctors, um, intimidation of them, uh, or people being moved around. So the team needs to get in, it needs to talk to victims, it needs to talk to witnesses, it needs to, needs to talk to the treating doctors, and then it needs access to the site. It needs to be able to take samples, to look at munitions, to try and work out the trajectory of those munitions, where they may have come from. Is it a bomb or is it a shell? They need also to try and take samples. It's more difficult with chlorine because chlorine is a gas and disappears quite readily. But with the likes of nerve agents, which are dispersed as fine aerosols, you know, a bit like a, a very um, a minute fly spray, if you like, if you get access to where there is a blast site, so where the weapon has exploded, the aerosols are pushed into all sorts of surfaces under pressure because of the blast. And this means that you will find the sar if it's sarin or some other nerve agent, you will find it in concrete, on tarmac, in wood, you'll find it on footwear and in clothing. So if you get these samples, then um, that's really important for determining what may have been used. As Susanna said earlier, um, some work that uh, I did with PHR in 1992 um, resulted in getting soil samples from craters where nerve agents had exploded four years previously. And we found breakdown products of mustard gas in two of those craters and the nerve agent sarin and some of its breakdown products in other craters. 
So these had been taken from a blast site. It was soil taken from the actual munition crater, if you like. So the concentrations were high and were still traceable four years later. So inspectors really have a window with nerve agents of, you know, some weeks, maybe even months to collect the samples, as long as the, there's been no attempt to clear the evidence away. As for attribution, that becomes more difficult. The OPCW is simply in the business of saying what it found and where it found it. The mechanism for attributing blame doesn't exist in the way it did until recently. In 2015, the UN Security Council set up a mechanism between the OPCW and the United Nations. It was called the Joint Investigations Mission. And that team was given the remit to apportion blame. It was a team of about 30. And in several of their reports, they said that Syria had undoubtedly used chlorine in three attacks, and it had used sarin in one attack last year in Khan Shakun. And there was no doubting that um, these agents had been used. And that the team also said used um, mustard gas on two occasions. But the mandate of that joint investigations mission was the extension of that mandate was vetoed by the Russians in 2017. So that mechanism no longer exists for apportioning blame. The only possible mechanism now is one the United Nations Security General could enforce himself if he felt there was a case for it. And such a mechanism was used in the Iraq-Iran war in the 1980s to investigate allegations of use. So that is a fallback option. But that team usually is quite small and doesn't have the resources or didn't in the past have the resources that the Joint Investigations Mission had with its 30-odd people and others that it could draw in to provide technical expertise. So the mechanism for apportioning blame uh, is really unsatisfactory at the moment. Okay, and, and we also do know that, I mean, the attack happened on April 7th. We know that the OPCW reached Damascus on April 14th, and then they weren't allowed access to the actual site until seven days after that. And there have been some reports and allegations of intimidation, not only of OPCW investigators, but also of people who survived the attack, doctors who are carrying out treatment um, for the survivors. There's been a lot of intimidation, allegedly, um, trying to keep people, people quiet, telling them not to say anything, threatening them and their families. So, Susanna, over to you. I'd love to understand from you, especially from the point of view from Physicians for Human Rights and other organizations that work alongside us, how much of a cause of concern is this and what do we want to see happening on the ground in order to make sure that justice is served and that something like this doesn't happen again? Well, of course, this is deeply concerning and it's quite outrageous that it took uh, two weeks uh, and it's still <clears throat> of concern that maybe the access to the site and certainly to uh, witnesses is uh, uh, being blocked or has been blocked and there are reports of intimidation of eyewitnesses including health professionals who may have treated victims as well as victims and patients themselves and their surrounding communities and loved ones is uh, deeply disturbing. The fact that, um, first of all, Physicians for Human Rights has called for uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations to immediately appoint uh, an independent joint investigation commission as, uh, or mission, as Alistair pointed out. The fact that um, that was vetoed is another outrage. And again, once again, as in many of the war crimes that are uh, being attributed to Syria and um, its uh, Russian and Iranian allies, uh, the Security Council has really failed in its fundamental obligations under, under the Charter of the United Nations. And so um, instead, one has to look to uh, all of the independent organizations that have, uh, I would say, heroically been collecting information, independent documentation uh, that um, supports um, the information that we hear coming from the ground, and that includes uh, an enormous amount of uh, video material, photographs, um, very courageous witnesses who have reported what has happened, 
And uh, the entire uh, international community really now needs to be calling, A, for a completely independent com um, commission to assign responsibility for the use of these uh, weapons, uh, as well as um, making sure that anyone who has information or evidence um, is protected. Um, and the idea that uh, people who were patients uh, and were doctors running to treat these victims could be in any way uh, threatened now or endangered because uh, they did the most fundamental humanitarian work or they were uh, victims is um, absolutely uh, outrageous. Alistair, what do you say to claims by Russia and by the Syrian government that this latest attack was fake, uh, that it was staged, and that nothing of the sort happened in terms of a chemical attack. Is there anything that we can see from the videos or from the photos that emerged or from any of the things that you've noticed that can debunk that, that theory from them? Well, I think the video evidence that I've seen suggests that something really awful has been used. None of the victims I saw had any physical injuries, and there were many um, uh, pictures of people who had been killed. They're deeply troubling. There seems to be good evidence that many of these videos are certainly authentic. It was evidence that convinced the World Health Organization to say that there were maybe up to 500 people affected and that an investigation was necessary. And to Russia and Syria, I simply say, allow the OPCW's fact-finding mission to do its work, to have unfettered access, to collect the evidence, uh, and to produce a report. If you have nothing to hide, then you shouldn't have to worry about the OPCW's mission. Uh, but don't do anything to obstruct it. As a follow-up to that, Alistair, what are Syria's obligations under the CWC, uh, what really are they obliged to do um, in terms of international legislation about uh, the illegal use of chemical weapons? And um, how can we hold them accountable if they are indeed behind attacks such as this one? Well, Syria was forced to sign the Chemical Weapons Convention in 2013 under pressure, if you like, uh, from uh, President Obama. Uh, and uh, the United States and Russia essentially made Syria sign the Chemical Weapons Convention. So unlike many other countries, it didn't do so willingly. But the convention is very clear. Countries must have nothing to do with chemical weapons, dispose of any stocks they've got, destroy any facilities for making chemical weapons, never use the agents, and certainly not to assist others to use the agents. Uh, and Syria, we know, was involved in declaring a substantial stockpile, and much of that was removed with help from about 30 other countries who offered all sorts of facilities for the destruction of that stockpile. But the OPCW has had continuing questions about Syria's full compliance with its obligations, and the continued attacks uh, imply that Syria uh, is not fully compliant. The attack with nerve agents last year indicated that Syria had the capability to make the nerve agent sarin. With chlorine, it's much more difficult because chlorine is, chlorine is so widespread. Uh, in a, you, you need it for the uh, treatment of water and for water, general water purification and to prevent all sorts of diseases you know, from contaminated water. But the Chemical Weapons Convention is very clear. Any chemical which through its chemical properties or its hazardous properties uh, is used deliberately to harm somebody is classed as a chemical weapon. So chlorine as used to hurt people in Syria is undoubtedly a chemical weapon. And Syria has been um, fingered, if you like, or, or being um, clearly shown to be the perpetrator of the use of chlorine on a number of occasions. So in that way, it's violating what it's supposed to do under the terms of the convention. What should happen? Well, I think those who are responsible for using the chemical weapons ought to be taken to court eventually uh, and to be judged. 
uh, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of evidence that can be used against them. Thank you, Alistair. I've got one last question for Susanna. As I mentioned in the very beginning of this live, unfortunately, the chemical weapons attacks are not the only uh, violations of humanitarian law that have taken place over the last seven years in, in this conflict. Uh, there's been the intentional, targeted, repeated attacks on healthcare across the country, on medical personnel, on hospitals. And um, can you speak a little bit more about that for us and sort of give us a framework of what, what we're looking at in terms of other ways that civilians are being targeted, which are illegal? Yes, and I mean, following on Alistair's um, uh, understanding and, and long comment. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, All right, I think, I think we have you back. Yes. I'm uh, sorry. Following on Alistair's um, a strong statement that uh, they should be taken to court, indeed, since the beginning of this conflict, Physicians for Human Rights has documented year after year uh, a, a huge range of violations of humanitarian law, effectively war crimes, and in, in our understanding and based on our documentation, amounting to crimes against humanity. This conflict um, really is a war that is bear, being carried out uh, essentially by the government of Bashar al-Assad of Syria against the civilian population of Syria. There has been the use of siege, literally starving out um, whole villages and communities. There has been enormous forced flight. We have the largest refugee uh, concentration all around uh, Syria's borders and beyond um, that the world has seen in a very long time. Uh, Two thirds uh, or more of the medical community of Syria has fled the country. And as indeed, as you mentioned, Jen, uh, Physicians for Human Rights has documented month after month a massive assault, deliberate in our view and in our estimation based on our evidence, uh, assault on health and using health as a target in the war. Hospitals, community health centers, doctors, nurses, lab technicians, indeed the very people who need to rescue people from the uh, horrific consequences of chemical weapons, but others like barrel bombs, which are also indiscriminate uh, in this conflict, are themselves being targeted in, the, in this horrific war. And so um, while we're focusing in this session on the horror of chemical weapons, the violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention by Syria and all of the consequences as well as the possible tampering of evidence and threatening of witnesses, we're also concerned that this entire conflict has, in the most unconscionable way, um, uh, harmed uh, civilian uh, lives and, and health. Well, I want to thank both of you very, very much today for all of your expertise. We had Professor Alistair Hay here and Susanna Serkin. If you want to see their full biographies, you can see it here on our Facebook page, one of our previous posts. So you can go on over to our website, phr.org. If you want to learn more about Physicians for Human Rights and all the things that we do and what our mission is, you can also find that on phr.org. Don't forget to... Follow us on Twitter as well. Our handle is at P4HR. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And hopefully we'll be doing this again very soon. Until next time. Bye-bye. Alistair. You're welcome. Bye-bye.